The Path of Prayer by Samuel Chadwick. Chapter 1. Being read by Peter John Parisi, also known as Brian Dean. None of my audios are copyrighted. Please feel free to make as many copies as you desire. Chapter 1. The Sign of Prayer. All religions pray. God and prayer are inseparable. Belief in God and belief in prayer are elemental and intuitive. The ideas may be crude and crude and primitive and pagan peoples, but they belong to the universal institution of the human race. The teaching of the Old Testament is full of the subject of prayer. Everywhere there are commands and inducements to pray, and the great stories of deliverance and victory, experience and vision are all examples of prevailing prayer. All the crises in the life of our Lord were linked with special seasons of prayer, and his teachings set forth wonderful assurances to those who pray. He laid down the laws of prayer, though he never sought to explain its mystery. Prayer was not a problem to him. The two parables he spake about prayer are not very acceptable to those who pray. There is something alien to the spirit of prayer in likening God to a heartless judge or a churlish friend. God is neither. The parables were not spoken as representative of God, but to illustrate the reward of importunity. The basis of prayer is sonship. Prayer is possible and reasonable because it is finel. It is natural for a child to ask of its father, and it is reasonable for the father to listen to the request of his child. Quote, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Unquote. Matthew 7, 11, and 1 Thessalonians 2, 11. There are many problems about prayer, but they lie outside the fact and experience of prayer, and apart from praying, there is no solution of them. Prayer is a fact of experience, and through all the ages the testimony of those who prayed, has been that God hears and answers the prayers of his children. What God Thinks About Prayer The thoughts of God are not as man's thoughts, neither are his ways man's ways. Quote, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Unquote. Isaiah 55, verse 9 God has made known his thoughts and his ways in the revelation of his word and in the person of his son. The medium of the revelation is experience, and the occasion is in the events of life in individuals and in history. God has never put his thoughts into a thesis of philosophy or metaphysics. He has interpreted in life and set forth his way in precepts, principles, and examples. There is one incident which tells us what God thinks of prayer. His mind concerning prayer is seen in every command to pray, and every law of prayer, and every promise concerning prayer, and in every example of answered prayer. Every part is part of the whole, but every subject of Scripture has its final and complete expression. And in the, con the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, there is a unique revelation of the mind of God concerning prayer. There are three persons in that incident of prayer. There are the man who prayed, the God who heard, and the man through whom the answer came. God is central. It is to him prayer is made. Through him prayer is interpreted. And by him prayer is answered. God speaks of prayer in terms of wonder. Quote, Behold, he prayeth, unquote. The language is that of humanity, but it is the only speech man knows, and however inaccurate it may be, it stands for corresponding reality in God. Can God wonder? Can there be in him elements of surprise and amazement? Can it be that th there are things that to God are wonderful? That is how God speaks, and to him there is nothing more gloriously wonderful than prayer. It would seem as if the biggest thing in God's universe is a man who prays. There is only one thing more amazing, and that is, that man, knowing this, should not pray. Behold, 
In that word there is wonder, rapture, exaltation. In the estimate of God, prayer is more wonderful than all the wonders of the heavens, more glorious than all the mysteries of the earth, more mighty than all the forces of creation. God interprets prayer as a sign of all that happened to Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus road. The event is variously expressed to the church of Judah. It was a conversion that turned their arch-persecutor into a preacher. This is how Paul the Apostle states it in writing to the Galatians. Quote, Afterwards I came into the regions of Sarah and Cilicia, and was unknown by face into the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me, unquote. That is a conversion that was the result of an experience. What was the experience? Paul says that in the experience it pleased God to reveal his Son in him. That it That is what the Damascus Road experience meant to him. When God speaks of it, he sums it all up in the words, quote, Behold, he prayeth, unquote. What, that is what it meant to God, and that is what it always means to him. Prayer is the symbol and proof and gauge of grace. All that happens in the converting work of grace, whereby we receive the adoption of sons, is that, being sons, we begin to pray. Saul of Tarsus had been a praying man all his life, but it was not until then that he began to pray as God interprets prayer. The children's hymn is equally applicable to grown people. I often say my prayers, but do I ever pray? Prayer is the privilege of sons and the test of sonship. It would seem as if God divided all men into the simple classification of those who pray and those who do not. It is a very simple test, but it is decisive and divisive. The way God answers prayer. God answers joyously. There is a ring of exaltation in the words he speaks to Ananias, like the joyous ring of our Lord's parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. Rejoice with me. Quote, Behold, he prayeth. Unquote. There is joy in the heart of God the Father when his lost children begin to pray. He answers like the God he is. Ananias may parley with God, but God never parleys with man. The answering hand of God waits for the lifted hand of man, and the heart that answers always transcends the heart that cries. The answer of Saul of Tarsus was twofold. He gave a vision and sent a messenger, a vision and a man, each corresponding to the other. That is God's way. First an assurance, and then the confirmation. That is the prayer of faith that never fails. God's servants are partners with him in the ministry of prayer. That is the mystery of spiritual cooperation. The Lord goes before the man he sends. Saul was prepared and waiting for the man he had already seen in a vision of God. Ananias found Saul prepared and waiting. God gave to Ananias the sign of prayer as the proof of grace. It was his own sign, and it is the sign he still gives. Is there any proof that a man is a man of God, like the fact that he is a man of prayer? Of Elijah, it is said that he, quote, prayed in his prayer, unquote. James 5, 17, 80, margin. Of some men, it is said that they live in an atmosphere of devotion. But it is one thing to live in an atmosphere of prayer, and another to, quote, pray in their praying, unquote. Finney went to a weekly prayer meeting where they prayed much and got no answers. Mueller prayed and answers came, and that is why all men believed him to be a man of God. When I was a very small boy, not more than six or seven years of age, I was sent on an errand to the house of a neighbor named Davenport. It was about nine o'clock in the morning. I knocked, lifted the latch, and stepped inside. On the hearth, kneeling at a chair on which was an open Bible, was Mrs. Davenport praying. 
She was unaware of my presence. I stood in silent awe for a moment, and then quietly stepped out and closed the door. It is more than sixty years since that morning, but from then till now I have known that Mrs. Davenport was a saint of God because she prayed. It is God's infallible sign, and it is the only sign that even the world accepts as an infallible proof. Prayer made all the difference to Saul of Tarsus, and it always makes all the difference. It brought a new assurance of God, a new confirmation of faith, a new fellowship of the people of God, a new experience of healing, a new vocation, a new inheritance, a new power. Prayer changes things. Prayer makes all things possible, for it links the praying soul to the omnipotent sea of God. Do we pray? Do we pray in our praying? Does God put his seal on our prayers? Lord, teach us to pray. Prayer is the contrite sinner's voice, returning from his ways, while angels in their songs rejoice and cry, Behold, he prays. Prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air, his watchword at the gates of death. He enters heaven with prayer. The Path of Prayer by Samuel Chadwick Chapter 2 Learning to Pray Can Prayer Be Learned? Is it not of the very soul of prayer that it shall be in the freedom of the Spirit? John the Baptist gave his disciples a form of prayer, and the disciples of Jesus asked to be taught to pray. There were not many things they asked him to do for them, and when they did, they were usually wrong. Would he have given them a form of prayer if they had not asked him? Why did they ask? His own praying awoke within them a desire to be able to pray. And when they wanted to pray, they found that they did not know how. They felt the need of some ordered form by which they could speak out to their hearts to God. They quoted John. There are still disciples who quote John the Baptist to Jesus. Forms are easier than a creative spirit. Prayers counted on a rosary are either easier than the prayers of a soul poured out in unrestrained speech to God. The prayer book helps the inarticulate to expression. Such praying may be perfectly sincere, and the devout may find in provided prayers a real help to devotion. And it may be that such praying may need to be learned at the feet of instructors. Indeed, that is the kind of prayer that needs to be learned. The rosary prayers are recited, and the free churchman seldom knows his way through morning or evening prayers in the prayer book. All praying begins with forms of prayer. There is hardly a soul but remembers the simple, earnest prayers repeated at the mother's knee with reverent wonder and joy. Personality in Prayer It is not other people's prayers that make the man of prayer. All true prayer, the prayer that prevails, is personal, intimate, and original. Hannah protests that she had poured out her soul to God. That is prayer, and yet it is not the whole of prayer. Receptivity is a real a part of prayer as expression. Saul of Tarsus had been a praying man from his youth, but he never really prayed till he met the risen Lord on the Damascus road. From the heavenward side, the whole change that had been wrought was summed up in the words, quote, Behold, he prayeth, unquote. The secret of Elijah's power in prayer was that he, quote, prayed in his prayer, unquote. That is the translation given in the margin of the authorized version. He, quote, prayed earnestly, unquote, is given in the text, and, quote, fervently, unquote, in the revised vision. With the note in the margin that says, the Greek literally is, quote, with prayer, unquote. He prayed with prayer. He prayed in his prayer. That is to say, he really prayed his prayers. He did not say prayers. He prayed in praying. His whole personality was in his supplication. He really wanted what he asked and fervently meant what he said. Can that kind of prayer be taught? It is the prayer that prevails. Formal routine of temple service, 
and the regular reading of words of second-hand inspiration and no understanding are neither acceptable to God nor profitable to man. They are vain repetitions. There is much praying that avails nothing, so far as we can judge. During the Baccarat scandal, W. E. Stead computed the number and value of the prayers offered every day in the Anglican Church for the Prince of Wales, and the computation of value was not in proportion to their number. He was probably wrong, for prayer is not accounted in terms of arithmetic. The real problem is not there. Prayers are measured neither by time nor by number, but by intensity. There are prayers that are impassionate, and there is no answer. And there are things for which we, ought, we know we ought to pray in an agony of prayer, and there is no power to pray. We do not know how to pray. Prayer learned by praying. There is no way to learn to pray but by praying. No reasoned philosophy of prayer ever taught a soul to pray. The subject is beset with problems, but there are no problems of prayer to the man who prays. They are all met in the fact of answered prayer and the joy of fellowship with God. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, and if prayer waits for understanding, it will never begin. We live by faith. We walk by faith. Edison wrote in 1921, quote, We don't know the millionth part of one percent about anything. We don't know what water is. We don't know what light is. We don't know what gravitation is. We don't know what enables us to keep our feet, not keep on our feet when we stand. We don't know what electricity is. We don't know what heat is. We don't know anything about magnetism. We have a lot of hypotheses about things. That is all. But we do but we do not let our ignorances about all these things deprive us of their use, unquote. We discover by using. We learn by practice. Though a man should have all knowledge about prayer, and though he understands all mysteries about prayer, unless he prays, he will never learn to pray. There have been souls that are mighty in prayer, and they learned to pray. There was a period in their lives when they were as others in the matter of prayer, but they became mighty with God and prevailed. In every incident, there was a crisis of grace, but it was in the discipline of grace that they discovered the secret of power. They were known as men of God because they were men of prayer. Some of them were renamed, like Jacob and Simon and Saul. They, became, they were called Praying John, Praying Mary, praying Bramwell, and praying Hyde. Our Methodist fathers were mighty in prayer. They saved England by prayer. They shook the gates of hell by prayer. They opened the windows of heaven by prayer. How did they learn to pray? They learned to pray by being much in prayer. They did not talk about prayer. They prayed. They did not argue about prayer. They prayed. Trained in prayer. Prayer touches infinite extremes. It is so simple that a little child can pray, and it is so profound that none but a child heart can pray. Montgomery's hymn was immortalized, has immortalized its profound simplicity. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed, the motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. Prayer is the simplest form of speech that infant's lips can try. Prayer the sublimest strains that reach the majesty on high. That is gloriously true. A cry brings God. A cry is mightier than the polished phrase. The Pharisee prayed within himself. His prayers revolved on ruts of vanity in his own mind and heart. The publican cried and was heard. It is not of emergency exits of the soul we are thinking, but the sustained habit and experience of the man of prayer. Such prayer comes by training, and there is no discipline so exacting. Coleridge says of such praying that it is the very highest energy of which the human heart is capable, and it calls for the total concentration of all the faculties. The great mass of worldly men and learned men he pronounced incapable of prayer. 
To pray as God would have us pray is the greatest achievement on earth. Such a life of prayer costs. It takes time. Hurried prayers and muttered um, lenities can never produce souls mighty in prayer. To become skilled in arts and mechanicism, mechanism, learners give hours regularly every day that they may become proficient. Our Lord rose before daybreak that he might pray, and not infrequently he spent all night in prayer. All praying saints have spent hours every day in prayer. One is afraid to quote examples. In these days there is no time to pray, but without time and a lot of it. We shall never learn to pray. It ought to be possible to give God one hour out of twenty-four all to himself. Anyway, let me make a start in the discipline of training in prayer by setting apart a fixed time every day for the exercise of prayer. We must seriously set our hearts to learn how to pray. Quote, to pray with all your heart and strength, with the reason and the will to believe vividly that God will listen to your voice to Christ and verily do the thing he pleases thereon, thereupon. That is the last, the greatest achievement of the Christian warfare upon earth, unquote. Teach us to pray, O Lord, we beseech thee. The praying spirit breathes, the watching power impart. From all entanglements beneath, call off my anxious heart. My feeble mind sustains, my worldly thoughts opposed. Appear and bid me turn again to my eternal rest. When you feel the strain of discipline, remember these words. Thou art oft most present, Lord, in weak, distracted prayer. A sinner out of heart with self most often finds thee there. For prayer that humbles sets the soul from all delusions free and teaches it how utterly, dear Lord, it hangs on thee. The Path of Prayer by Samuel Chadwick Chapter 3, being read by Peter John Parisi, also known as Brian Dean. Praying in secret. If prayer is the greatest achievement on earth, we may be sure it will call for a discipline that corresponds to its power. The spirit of prayer has its conditions and demands. It is a forbidden place to all but those who set purpose and resolved hearts. Strong men often break down under the strain of study. Concentration is a heavier task than handling a hammer or guiding a plow. The discipline curves freedom and drills the mind to attention. Understanding is more taxing than doing, and meditation is a severer tax than service. The reason so many people do not pray is because of its cost. The cost is not so much in the sweat of agonizing supplication as in the daily fidelity to the life of prayer. It is the acid test of devotion. Nothing in the life of faith is so difficult to maintain. There are those who resent the association of discipline and intensity with prayer. They do not pray like that. And certainly, they would not like their children to entreat and plead for anything they wanted with, quote, strong crying and tears, unquote. That is quite likely. But then, no one suspects them of praying like that. And the... Uh, uh, um, analog of their children may not be the whole truth. Nothing can be further from the truth than a false analog. The school of prayer is for those who really want to learn to pray. Those who come to learn are disciples. They put themselves under the yoke of him from whom they seek to learn. And the first condition of learning is a teachable spirit. Our Lord has the authority to teach. And he himself is example as well as instructor. There is no appeal beyond him. Having besought him to teach us how to pray, we surrender mind and heart to his teaching and yield all to the discipline of loyal and believing obediency. What does our Lord teach us as to prayer? One of the first things he commands is that there shall be a place of prayer. It is quite true that the whole earth is the Lord's, and that there is no place where prayer may not be heard. God wills that men should pray everywhere, wherever 
we may be, he is nigh at hand, and not far off. And wherever there is a praying heart, the soul finds the sanctuary of God. No one would suspect that Jesus did not appreciate the sacredness of the earth, which he said was the footstool of God. But it was his habit to draw into a solitary place to pray. He needed the fenced spaces of silence. To his disciples he said, quote, And when ye pray, ye shall not be as the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of none. Verily I say unto you, They have received their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy inner chamber, and having shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall recompense thee. Unquote. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. Why does he insist upon this inner chamber and the closed door? The first reason is that the first quality God requires in prayer is reality. Hypocrites never pray in secret. Prayers that are a pretense require an audience. They are intended to be heard of men, and they have their reward in skill of phrasing, a show of earnestness, and a reputation for piety. These things do not count with God. They cannot live in his presence. Prayer is between the soul and God alone. The silent spaces of the soul. The soul needs its silent spaces. It is in them we learn to pray. There, alone, shut in with God, our Lord bids us pray to our Father who is in secret, and seeth in secret. There is no test like solitude. Fear takes possession of most minds in the stillness of the solitary place. The heart shrinks from being alone with God who seeth in secret. Who shall abide in his presence? Who can dwell with God, who is shadowless light? Hearts must be pure and hands clean that dare shut the door and be alone with God. It would revolutionize the lives of most men if they were shut in with God in some secret place for half an hour a day. For such praying, all the faculties of the soul need to be awake and alert. When our Lord took Peter and James and John with him to the secret place of prayer, they were heavy with sleep. It was the same in the Mount of Glory and the Garden of Agony. It was, it was not until they were fully awake that they saw the glory or realized the anguish. There are some silent places of rare wisdom where men may not talk, but they find it possible to sleep. Mooning is not meditation, and drowsy repose is not praying. The secret place of prayer calls for every faculty of mind and heart. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. As for praise, so for prayer the whole being is called. There is a vital difference between private and corporal prayer. Each kind of prayer brings blessing after its kind, but there is a difference. Corporate prayer is thus exacting. There is a sense of fellowship that gives courage and inspires expression. Guided prayer is companionable, but it has a tendency to do its thinking by proxy. In private prayer, the soul stands naked and alone in the presence of God. The thought is personal. Prayer is original. Motive is challenge. Corporate prayer gives a spirit of fellowship. Private prayer, prayer, private prayer disciplines personality. Who can measure the influence of an hour a day spent alone with God? The Hill of the Lord. The way into the Holy Presence is not a thoroughfare. The inner chamber into which a man goes is his own but it is the presence of God that makes it a holy place. To a secular mind, there would be no presence. It is the seeking soul that finds. There are some people to whom no audience is given. There are souls that cannot pray. Jane says of some men that they need not think they can receive anything of the Lord. Even before Christ taught men to pray, the psalmist declared, quote, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear, unquote. Psalm 66:18. The judgment seat of God is in the inner chamber, but the throne of grace is there also, or none would ever dare to enter in. 
forgotten sins start into life, and hidden things stand naked and open before him, with whom we have to do. All who would enter the holy presence and live must have a sincere desire for God and a conscious set on dwelling in the light. Our Lord laid emphasis upon the forgiving spirit, the one thing above all others that bolts and bars the way into the present chamber of prayer is unwillingness to forgive from the heart. No gift can be accepted of God until reconciliation has been made. Quote, if therefore thou art willing, no, if therefore thou art offering thy gift at the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift, unquote. Matthew 5, verses 23 to 24. Again, when Jesus stated the law of faith in relation to prayer, he said, quote, Therefore I say unto you, All things whatsoever ye pray and ask for, believe that ye have received them, and ye shall have them. And whensoever ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against anyone, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses, unquote. Mark 11:24-26. Quote, but if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Unquote. Matthew 6:15. Why did he lay such emphasis upon forgiveness? Was it not for the same reason that the law and the prophets placed the emphasis upon righteousness? All who would come to the holy place and the holy one must be holy. And whoever will come to the God of mercy must be merciful. The petitioner for grace must believe in grace. Thine inner chamber. Let no soul be discouraged for making a beginning. Schools are graded to the capacity of the learners. The great souls who become mighty in prayer and rejoice to spend three and four hours a day alone with God were once beginners. They went from strength to strength. For our comfort, let us remember that it is into our own inner chamber we enter. And the God who is there is our Father. Many years ago, a sweet little girl stole into my bedroom in the house where I was staying. She proudly, pitifully over all the wonders of her child world. But when I asked if Father was up, she looked radiantly and reverently into my eyes and said, Oh, my daddy always talks with God in the drawing room before breakfast. Happy Father. Happy Child. Happy God. The Path of Prayer by Samuel Chadwick Chapter 4, being read by Peter John Parises, also known as Brian Dean. The Inner Room and the Closed Door Quote, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thine inner chamber. And having shut thy door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret. And thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall recompense thee. Unquote. Matthew 6.6 6. There are two difficulties awaiting us at the threshold of this command. One is that many have no inner chamber. There is no place in their lives for privacy. They have no room that is not shared. And if they could find room, they have no leisure. The closed door may neither shut out nor shut in. <clears throat> the wireless has made us familiar with the fact that neither bolted doors nor shuttered windows can secure privacy. Thought is more subtle than sound, and Satan is more cunning than the wireless expert. The saints who have been practiced in private prayer, bear witness to the adversaries that keep watch at the door of their soul's inner chamber. Where shall we find the secret place? My aim is not to instruct, but to suggest. Manuals of devotion have usually been to me depressing rather than helpful. They are either too mechanical or too exacting. They discourage rather than inspire. I want to write quite frankly, and in the first person. All my life I have wanted to learn to pray. 
In my zeal I have experimented and explored in likely and unlikely ways, in schools of prayer and without pose of pride. I want in meekness and humility to tell you what I have learned. I speak for myself. I judge no man's method, criticize no man's counsel, challenge no man's experience. I speak with utmost simplicity, and you must judge what I say. Let us begin with the difficulty of privacy. There are tens of thousands of Christian disciples who have no room to which they can retire for private prayer. They live with other people, sleep with other people, work with other people. They cannot escape from people. Is not this a reason why the door of the house of God should never be closed? On Monday morning, a penitent sinner stopped me in the main street of the town where I had preached on the Sunday. There were three.